Welcome to the Craig Thomas Discovery and Visitor <laughs> Center. My name is Kevin Schneider. I'm the Deputy Superintendent here at Grand Teton National Park. Um, and, and just want to thank the Grand Teton National Park Foundation for organizing uh, this wonderful event tonight. Uh, it's a great opportunity, I think, for all of us to come out and, and vicariously be part of some extreme ski mountaineering. Um, you know, outdoor recreation plays really a fundamental role in connecting us with the natural world. I know for myself, when I come to work on a Monday morning, if I spent Friday and sa Saturday and Sunday in the park being a visitor, enjoying it, playing in it, uh, I'm a lot better off for the week. And I think this is just a great opportunity to learn about um, ski mountaineering and the history of it from people who have, three people who have uh, really pushed the boundaries of the sport. Um, Tom Torriano has been active uh, skiing and guiding in the mountains around Jackson uh, Hole since 1985. He's author of Teton Skiing, a History and Guide, and Select Peaks of Greater Yellowstone, a Mountaineering History and Guide. Uh, he's busy working on a photo guidebook to backcountry skiing and ski mountaineering throughout the Jackson Hole region. We've got Mark Newcomb. Mark was born here in Jackson. His father was a, was a snow and avalanche forecaster, founded the American Avalanche Institute, and is a guide and part owner of Exum Mountain Guides, an organization that he has been part of for 45 years. His mother is an artist well known for her work in ceramics. Mark became an outdoor professional in 1991 after traveling in China, Pakistan, uh, and Nepal for almost a year. He went on to guide for Exum Mountain Guides, uh, teach avalanche classes for the American Avalanche Institute, guide skiers for Valdez Heli Ski Guides, and work as a brand ambassador and professional athlete for Marmot. In 2009, he completed a master's in economics and finance from the University of Wyoming. He's currently on the Teton County Planning Commission, conducts research and provides granting uh, support for the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, serves on the board of directors for the Grand Teton National Park Foundation, and provides what he can to help Allison, his wife, as they raise uh, two boys, one aged two and a half, the other aged nine months. And then finally, Brian Harder came to the Tetons in 1996 and started guiding for Exa Mountain Guides in 1999. He's traveled and climbed locally and abroad during a mountaineering career spanning over 35 years. He's recently taken a lifelong love of competitive endurance racing and applied the fitness mindset uh, to ski mountaineering objectives here at home. A founding member of the Grand Teton Speed Project, he and a tight-knit group of like-minded Lycra clad skiers are busy <laughs> redefining standards for ski descents and enchainments in the Tetons and the Wasatch. A practicing orthopedic physician assistant, Brian also writes about training and adventuring in his blog, Get Stronger, Go Longer, and is a contributing editor for OuterLocal.com. Brian will soon be moving to Anchorage, where he hopes to apply these tactics to the greater ranges of Alaska. So if you could, please turn your cell phones off as we listen to this great presentation. And let's give uh, Mark, Brian, and Tom a warm welcome. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. It's great to see a lot of friends here tonight. Um, and we want to thank the park a lot for having us tonight and the foundation. And I want to thank Mark for inviting me to join him. He was the, the impetus behind this and, uh, and uh, it's great to be up here with, with he and Brian. Um, Are we ready? Yeah. Are you ready, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> so there's been a lot of talk about ski mountaineering lately. Almost an overload. Slideshows, articles, Facebook and outer local posts, movies, and tragic avalanche accidents around the world. Including two of our own last week. Yet here we are again, giving airtime to an activity that the majority of humans would consider an outrageous fringe stunt that is downright selfish and crazy. There must be something to this game of ski mountaineering that brings so many of us back 
again and again, either to the mountains themselves or to venues like this. Tonight, Mark, Brian, and I each would like to share our motivation for ski mountaineering, and we'd like to attempt to provide some sort of explanation or justification for this peculiar activity, which appears to benefit only a few individual individuals, yet have has such far-reaching impacts on the rest of society. So far for myself, I wouldn't trade my experiences in the mountains and the moments I've shared with partners, students, and clients for any other lifestyle or vocation. I'm so lucky and grateful that I've been able to enjoy so many years of fun and adventure with skis on snow. Like it or not, this idea of bigger, stronger, and faster, which is the title of the show, if you didn't notice, is part of our DNA. And, and although I hate to admit it, I, that, that bigger, stronger, faster once ran thick in my blood. I believe bigger, stronger, and faster is a driver in, the, in human evolution. It is that part of us that has pushed humanity to new heights and allowed our bodies and minds to grow stronger and more capable. Not every one of us is or has to be driven in this way, but many of us are and have to be. Society has, in a way, rejected this natural impulse among some of us dubbing it grandiose, extreme, or just bro -braism. But this is a disservice to humanity. Guys like Steve Romeo and Chris Onifer exemplified this spirit or impulse to pull off bigger, stronger, and faster achievements, and they should be honored for it. Bigger, stronger, and faster no longer drives me, so after some thought, I've identified three other aspects of ski mountaineering that remain and continue to feed, to feed my soul and keep me coming back for more. First of all, and most simply, skiing in the mountains of Greater Yellowstone has allowed me to touch and know the beauty of winter from up close and from within. From awe at the, at the intricacy of snow crystals on a micro scale, <coughs> to magical moments with resident wildlife. <laughs> to, the spect to the spectacle of the symmetry and flukes of natural forms. to the breathtaking rush. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to the breathtaking rush of being tiny in the face of vastness. <clears throat> to the enriching radiance of natural light. The second aspect that I love about skiing mountains is, is flow. Just as rock climbing, surfing, and paragliding flow through, the tr flow through the mediums of rock, water, and air, mountain skiing is the artful and masterful expression of graceful and efficient movement through snow-covered mountains. <coughs> flow refers to such things as route finding, safe team travel, and how the route <coughs> meshes with topography as evidenced by the tracks I leave behind, both in downhill and in uphill modes. Flow references physical comfort with weather, hardship, persistence, exposure, exercise. Flow refers to mental attitude, feelings of freedom, Ability to recover. <laughs> there she is, she climbed the mountain with those. <clears throat> and, it, and it also <coughs> flow refers to the intricacies of the turn itself sensitivity and focus, flow and creativity, 
alignment and balance, patience and strength, poise and efficiency, commitment, trust, <laughs> breath and presence. Exploration probably drives me more than any other factor. I want to explore my home mountains and see all of its nooks and crannies. Each canyon, cirque, and mountain has its own personality and treasure waiting to be discovered. Each, each time I go, I can look around and see where I've been and learn about new places that I'd like to explore. Summits are a milestone in exploration and a, and a symbol of the broadening of one's perspective to handle a wider vi variety of challenges in the future. On summits, there is an inexplicable release, reward, an opportunity for gratitude. Beyond these personal reasons for pursuing ski mountaineering, many of us who have pursued and devoted much of our lives to the sport have felt compelled to give back to society in some way, mostly by sharing knowledge and information through guiding, blogging, journalism, video, photography, and speaking. However, this sharing of such a dangerous activity could be considered to be a bit like a cigarette ad. It sure looks cool, but it's not very good for anyone in the long run. As a guidebook author and ski guide, I've long struggled with the thought that my enthusiasm in sharing could lead to someone else's demise. Yet, I also see on a daily basis incredible amounts of, incredible amounts of joy and revelation in the faces and spirits of the people I ski with. And frankly, that's priceless. On a deeper level, ski mountaineering, backcountry skiing, rock climbing, and any risky venture for that matter gives me and every one of us an opportunity to practice being present, mindful, and in one's true essence. In environments that by their nature have fairly clear and simple rules and require presence and mindfulness for both short-term and long-term survival. My hope is that this practice of staying in the now and being mindful will rub off in daily life where I seem to where I seem much more likely to crash and burn. <laughs> there the va va variables are much more complex and the rules much less obvious, such as relationships and challenging projects. Bigger, stronger, and faster, for, for each of us, we can't really force it. We kind of have to let it occur naturally for ourselves. And. Um, Perhaps the biggest test for me early in my ski career when I did have bigger, stronger, faster running through my blood uh, was a, in a series of attempts on the Hasek McGowan route on the Grand Teton. And, uh, if you're not familiar with the route, let's see if I can do it on this angle, but it starts here. And uh, did I hit it? I can't even see. <laughs> there it is. Somewhere down there. <laughs> um, so from Tiwanak, uh, in May of 1989, I got this view of the northeast side of the Grand, and um, I, that this kind of strip of snow caught my eye, and I just immediately kind of thought, huh. I wonder if another route is possible to ski off the Grand Teton. Um, a few, few weeks later, Stephen Koch and I went ahead and uh, skied, skied the Grand Teton. That was the first snowboard, snowboard descent, and that was in June of 89. And um, that felt pretty good. And I went back east to visit my parents that summer. And I was looking at photos. You know, that was before internet, so we had to actually look at a book. And uh, uh, looking at photos of the Grand and, and trying and kind of going back to that Hasek McGowan route and again wondering if it was possible. And um, right away, that bigger, stronger, faster impulse just turned right on and stirred up all this adrenaline. And right away, sitting there on the couch in New York, I had all this adrenaline running, uh, skiing 
the Hasek McGowan route, and uh, I knew that I would have to give it a try. And so in sp the next spring, spring 1990, uh, Mike Collins and I headed up, and um, we planned, we knew that conditions were going to be the big factor on that route because it faces northeast, and anything <coughs> that faces northeast gets a lot of sun in the spring because that's where the sun rises and it melts just the surface and then you have a crust and then underneath is powder and then the skiing's not very good and and it's the surface is very icy and and kind of breakable um, so we knew we had to sort of be there right when the conditions are right so we went up brought a bunch of gear up there started camping up there went back down to sleep a few nights in the valley came back up waiting for right conditions but it never really came it kept <laughs> It kept avalanching, and, and, and actually after the first view of it, Mike said, you know what, I, I think I, I'll pass on this one. <laughs> so I had to find another partner, uh, Andy Matz, and Andy and I went up a new, uh, several times uh, and just watched avalanches pour out of this, um, out of the couloir. So around that time, you know, Stephen and I had been doing a lot of uh, ski mountaineering together, and he went to Europe and had it uh, kind of a came back with a whole new, whole new attitude, and, and, he, and he he was like, yeah, I want to be part of that. And so the two of us, you know, that was that was going to be my ticket to get up there because Stephen was really driven. And so in spring of 1991, we went back, camped at the base of the route, and uh, we we thought we had picked the conditions pretty good, and we started up and. Pretty much right away, we realized it's too icy, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're maybe 500 feet up the couloir at the bottom. And I remember yelling up to Stephen, "We're not going to ski this." And he, he said, "Probably not, but it's pretty fun <laughs> to climb." So we kept climbing with our skis on our back. We should have just pitched our skis, but um, uh, we kept climbing, and we we got up to the um, notch. Uh, between the second tower and the rest of the mountain, and then we were going to continue up the east face. And um, the snow was so rotten that we couldn't proceed. It was uh, wet up to our waist, and uh, you know we—it was too just too dangerous to continue up there because we were worried about the whole thing just carrying us off the mountain. So there, at 10:30 in the morning, we dug a hole and uh, waited out in a beautiful day in a little snow hole. This is actually, of course, uh, getting toward dusk here. But we had plenty of water because I put a little black, black plastic bag in my pack and made a little divot in the snow and then put snow on the black plastic. And then before you know it, you have gallons and gallons of water. But we did only have one power, you know, pemmican bar between us. So we, we just nibbled at that all night. <laughs> Around 2 in the morning, our feet got cold. And we thought, well, there's probably enough of a crust to continue up on. So we, we left the cave and um, uh, despite our, we both, we kept our feet warm by somehow, I don't know how we did it, but we had our feet on each other's bellies. <laughs> 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 Crammed in that snow hole. Oops, sorry. Um, both of us fit in there. I was jammed up in the, in the right in there. And uh, so around four in the morning, uh, with the northern lights aglow, we got to the summit and um, um, we waited a while. We were thinking we might ski the Ford Couloir, but it was so cold, we said, let's get out of here. And so we went down the Owen Spaulding. But um, you know, we came down with quite a story from that one. And, uh, and I think I'm going to let Mark take over from here. Uh, and. Um, and uh, from from here, we'll uh, finish the rest of the story. But uh, I, I I have not gone back to to try that again. Um, I think you only have a limited amount of bigger, stronger, faster in you. And at some point, that goes away. <laughs> but uh, that little few years of bigger, stronger, faster, I think, is a big part of what helps us evolve. So with that, Mark. Thanks a lot, Tom. For the audience, we 
we want to make it a little bit interactive tonight. We don't want to take too much time, but when I, uh, at one point when I got back from traveling around Asia and was starting to kind of pursue a professional outdoor lifestyle, I was headed up to the park uh, with my father and we were going to do some work for Exum, some maintenance stuff, and he said, uh, you know, I was staring up at the Grand Teton, he said, well, you know, Turiano's up there today skiing the North Face. <laughs> and I was just stone silent and, and looked at him and said, what? And he said, well, I guess so. Um, at, at any rate, it was inconceivable, flat out inconceivable to me that anyone would be able to do that um, and let alone bold enough to do that. But um, uh, one of the other things about that period of time is that there were really only two people that I was told you should ever talk to if you wanted to learn how to ski steep terrain. One of them was Bill Briggs, of course, and the other was Tom Turiano. So something that uh, I asked Tom the other night, and I wouldn't mind hearing from him again, and I think it would be fun for the audience too, is um, how he became so devoted to skiing steep terrain because uh, Tom uh, did at the time, and certainly still does, had the turn that you need to make in steep terrain broken down minutely where your body needed to be, where your hands needed to be, you know, your position and your state of mind. And, uh, and, and I'm just curious where that came from, when it began. Yeah, I, um, I grew up in upstate New York and uh, on, on the biggest hill in Monroe County. And um, <laughs> that's where I learned how to ski steeps and that's where I learned how to climb snow. You know, we'd have people come sledding from all over and they packed it so firm but you know, and you know, we didn't have crampons. We just booted up, and that's where I learned how to edge on, uh, you know, edge with my boots and climb snow and balance. And and if I slipped, I knew how to stop. And it was just all, you know, from when I was a little boy. And uh, and then, um, you know, skiing on that hill as well. Uh, I remember watching a movie once. Uh, can't remember the name of it now, but. Um, it had Bo Bridges as the actor, and, and uh, of course it was probably a stunt double that did the skiing, but I watched this guy come down Mount Tom in the, in the um, Sierras doing this amazing turn and um, on steep terrain, and I said, I'm going to learn how to do that. And so I actually made little skis with Cubco bindings, <laughs> and I taught myself to do that turn on the back of a hill in my house. And I used little skis because I knew I would need, it was not, not that big of a hill, so I, I had to shorten my skis so I could make some room. Uh, and, uh, and then when I came to Jackson, I fell right in with Bill Briggs and started teaching skiing with him and, and did, you know, trained in his uh, ski school. And he, he basically kind of, you know, I, from, from him I learned all the techniques that that uh, um, that I needed that I, you know, I I was doing them already, but then he kind of taught me what I was doing, <laughs> and um, and then from there I started teaching them and sort of solidifying the the ideas as uh, as I was teaching them as well. Um, so yeah, and then then to be able to take them up onto the peaks, I think, was the real. The thing that really solidified it for me, and and then uh, and then working for Exum, I started teaching. I, I organized these ski mountaineering camps, and then, then it became this, uh, you know, sort of came full circle. And I started teaching the, the techniques that Bill taught me, and uh, and then Coombs Coombs came along and, and added even more into it. So uh, Doug and I worked those camps together. Uh, in the mid '90s, with Mark, and um, those were good old days. <laughs> and we're gonna hopefully take questions from the audience too once the three of us are finished. So, if you have some questions, hold on to them. But again, we don't want to go too too long tonight. Um, I might hold on to it. Wander a little bit. 
So, uh, um, as I mentioned, when I came back from my travels around China, I I wasn't working full time. I, I was kind of in and out of some carpentry jobs. Um, I had applied to work on a ski patrol, and I was just tel telemarking in the backcountry with the classic, you know, leather boots and big long double camber skis. And um, it wasn't until I got hired on the ski patrol that I actually started skiing enough to to feel a little bit comfortable skiing in steeper terrain. And really largely on the inspiration of Tom and with my climbing background and you know having a father like I have it uh, wasn't too long before I took an interest in the peaks but I, I really knew that I needed to have a, a very solid steep turn so uh, often as a ski patrol you could see me out there in the toilet bowl getting on the backside of one of the bigger moguls and seeing what the very steepest possible terrain I could I could turn on crank a turn and just as often tumbling all the way down toilet bowl with my cross on and whatnot. And, uh, I had several people ski by and you know say something like, you're having a bad day, dude. But um, I, got, I did improve over time. And, um, and, and after a succession of, of um, successful and some not successful efforts in the Tetons, um, decided that I was ready to maybe set my sights on the Hossack McGowan and um, fully riding on Tom's coattails and uh, started for me sort of diving into the intellectual challenge behind it because uh, I, I can't remember if it was Tom's final effort but uh, I was up there with him and we did make one of those attempts in early June and I saw how suddenly and how intensely that morning sun hits the Hossack McGowan um, with its easterly aspect. And I think somehow we put our heads together, um, probably with Stephen Koch also, and figured that we probably needed to actually make a midwinter attempt. But the thing about the high peaks in the middle of winter is that they really are mostly blown free of snow. You know, we ski out the ski area, we're largely below 10,000 feet. And, you know, if you ever spend too much time at the top of Rendezvous Peak, you realize how, how much wind there is and how little snow that can leave behind except that it you know, just drifts down in the bowl. So the storms in winter are so cold and so windy that up high they really don't deposit much snow. That leaves a pretty small window of time. And this, um, this photo, I don't know if any of you recognize it, shows probably the Hossack McGowan in a pretty, it's, it's a little bit blurry, in a pretty standard condition for the middle of winter. And you can see all the cliff bands and the slabs that are there in summer and that need to be coated by snow before it reaches uh, a, a point where you can ski it. But this is actually right out on the wall. You can check it out on your way out. And I took a picture of it with my iPhone on the way in and popped it into the slideshow. <laughs> Just the photo I've been looking for. Um, and, and so um, I needed to figure out how to, you know, how, how to judge when the Hossack McGowan would be in condition. Because um, even if you drive north far enough to see it from the valley, you can only see the upper half of it. And the lower half is just as cruxy, in fact, even a little steeper than the upper half. And, um, and, and I was never gonna drive that far north every day anyway. Uh, by that time, I, I was working full time on the ski patrol, uh, among a few other activities and it, it was harder to find time um, and I had some of the other ski mountaineering adventures that I'd been on helped sort of set a time frame within which I could start working um, this was on a descent of the black ice Kular um, with Stephen Koch and uh, it was his vision and inspiration to uh, use the black ice couloir as one way, you know, of kind of stepping it up and pushing the boundaries. And we ended up at the uh, top of the black ice couloir in early June. And um, this was, for me, pretty standard garb in those days with the full-on alpine gear, alpine boots, skis, uh, you know, 203s, OTAs, um, you know, the ski poles from the ski area, and uh, whatever gear I could get on sale at TM and Skinny. 
Um, and the thing about the black ice that day is that the sun was already high enough in the sky, despite its northern exposure, to give it a little bit of a sheen, that, give it that crust that Tom had mentioned. And it was a breakable crust, so as hard as it was to ski it, due to just how steep it was and narrow, it was even harder with that crust. And rather than turn back though, Stephen and I decided to ski on ropes and we skied the upper section on belay, rappelled over the ice climb and used the ropes for one more rope length to start skiing on the upper, on the, the sort of midway snow field before we went on down. So that gave me kind of a, an idea that June would be too late. Um, and then the other uh, Stephen Koch inspiration out the ski area was this line on Cody Peak called, uh, he, he called it Talk is Cheap after he did it for the first time. Um, many skiers out the ski area had looked at it for a good long time and, and really wanted to give it a try. In those days the boundaries were closed though, so you were either going to you know, have to come up from the bottom or sneak out of bounds or wait until the, the gates were open. And um, despite all that, you still also had to wait until this space filled in. And watching that over the course of a couple of years, I, I realized that that's probably a pretty good indicator face for um, the high Teton peaks on northeastern aspects and probably the Hossack McGowan too. So for those of you who have watched it this winter, if you have it all, for the most part, it hasn't really filled in. We've had some pretty strong east-northeast winds that have stripped it. And um, I would hazard to guess that the Hossack McGowan probably isn't in condition either. So um, I, I, needed to, I needed to do a couple things. I needed to really, you know, see if I thought that made sense, that if that, that, that indeed the conditions on that face correlated with conditions up in the high peaks. I also needed to uh, solve the problem of how to get into the high peaks in winter because uh, in those days, the, the lightweight Ronda Nagir was just being introduced. And even if I could have afforded to buy some, which I couldn't, I wasn't sure I trusted it. Um, there, you know, there were plenty of Europeans skiing on the Dinafit gear, very few North Americans, and those that did, you weren't quite sure that you were going to be able to consistently crank turns in all kinds of terrain and all kinds of conditions and not pre-release. And, you know, pre-release in that kind of terrain certainly would be fatal. So um, we were on our full-on alpine gear, and, uh, and, and then from there it went all the way down to our ski mountaineering approach gear. Um, or, or not ski mountaineering, but just regular winter mountaineering approach gear, which would have been a mountaineering boot and kind of a silveretta type crampon style binding and some, some sort of shorter ski. And, and what I figured we were gonna have to do is actually approach from the Taggart Lake parking lot with that setup, carrying our Alpine gear on our back. And, um, and, and furthermore, Hans and I weren't even sure what kind of, or uh, Hans, we'll hear more about Hans Johnstone later, but we, we weren't sure about what we would find in, in the Hossam Gown in winter. Um, it hadn't occurred to us that it hadn't been climbed. We just figured that we didn't know who had climbed it and um, weren't sure what the conditions would be. But anyway, so our gear ended up looking more like this. So this would have this been on our backs. This has, you know, a, a 200 foot rope and alpine ski boots, crampons, couple ice axes. Right now it doesn't have the uh, two liters of water you would need for a you know, 16 hour day. <laughs> and it doesn't have the extra clothes and whatnot. And a little later tonight. A little later tonight, Brian Harder is gonna show us what people are doing this stuff with today. Um, so at, at any rate, again, I was working on ski patrol and uh, I really wanted to test this whole setup out. And I probably could have tested it somewhere else like Tiwanot, but um, I myself had not skied Central Kular, classic test piece. And I was also, um, pretty interested in seeing if I could 
ski that line and work my way into central Kular. So what I, I ended up having to do is uh, one day when I had a day off and conditions were perfect, is take my setup and head up from the bottom of the ski area because I really didn't want to break the rules as an employee of the ski area. I, I did kind of because I, I used Union Pass and skinned up Union Pass and headed up Rock Springs Bowl and got up into Cody Bowl, left my ski mountaineering equipment behind, hiked the ridge, skied central, traversed back around, hiked the ridge again and skied um, talk is cheap. And, and knowing full well that my coworkers were over there just gnashing their teeth. Like, what, what's that guy doing out there? He could ski out of bounds. I, I ought to go out there right now and yank his pass. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even, you know, I, I, I really, I knew at some point probably they would figure out who it was, but I didn't want it to happen right away. I mean, hopefully. The, after the ski area closed or something. So that night there was a, a basketball game between the, the, the J trollers, we were called, the young guys and the, and the old guys, the regular, regular patrols. So not only did I do all that, but I got down and played 45 minutes of basketball. Just to, I figured if I didn't show up, they, they would have put two and two together. Um, I'm gonna, we, we actually happened to get some footage the other day, so bear with me just a couple minutes, not the other day, but a couple, a few years ago, uh, then I'm gonna try and pull up here. Um, so I did manage to uh, pull that off and um, finally then, you know, really just had to hunker down and wait for conditions um, and, and really just completely lucked out because like Tom, I didn't know it then, but I really only had a few years of vim and vigor in, in terms of my ski mountaineering. Uh, in me also, and uh, and if if the perfect conditions hadn't come along when they did, I'm quite sure I never would have done the Hasek McGowan. But how it happened is that uh, we had we started having our big winters in the mid '90s, and the the first one of those was a very wet early winter, very wet, warm, with relatively calm. So I I knew I extrapolated that that was really good for the upper mountain. I started paying paying attention to my indicator face. And uh, the only unfortunate thing is that I, I had an opportunity to go to Sikkim for a month, uh, starting in kind of the first week of January. And um, I thought, boy, you know, if, if I'm in Sikkim and this, the conditions come in, I'll, I'll shoot myself. But I also, I can't pass up a trip to Sikkim. So off I went, came back, and in those days there was very little internet and whatnot. I wasn't really in touch at all. But as soon as I got back to New York City, I called um, Hans Johnstone and, and said, you know, what's going on in the mountains? He said, it's been, you know, splitter for two weeks. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, we, we just went up and did the middle or something. And he was like, do you want to uh, climb the North Ridge? And I said, well, you know, I only have a day before I have to start work again. Um, why don't we maybe try the Hasek McGowan, at least take a look. And so, um, not only that, but my flight was delayed, so I had an extra night in New York, just completely going berserk. But I, I got home and um, went out to the ski area just after it had closed, picked up my gear, uh, went back, got a couple hours of sleep, and then Hans and I set off and um, managed to actually get the Hasuk McGowan when it looked more like this. This photo, I think, was more from May, but 
in stark contrast to what it looks like stripped in the middle of winter. And this is a photo from the morning just as, uh, just as we were getting up to Teton Glacier, the sun, the, the Alpen glow was on the north face. And of course, there's very dramatic foreshortening here, but that's the bottom of the couloir. It goes up to an, an ice bulge there, which Hans, I think, climbed with one ice ax. And uh, up here, and then kind of disappears from sight. And we were quite intimidated by this central section. We really weren't sure what to find. It turned out the conditions were so perfect, the snow was so secure uh, that we just kept on marching and, and we had the rope stacked in our pack and ready to go, but we didn't even pull it out. And by the time we got to a point where we actually needed it, we were in a situation like this where we didn't want to let go and, and tie in. So we just kept climbing without the rope the whole way. Um, but you know, normally, if, if you're in the mountains, and this was uh, mid-February. Normally, if you're in the mountains in mid-February, and you get close to rocks like this, you'll encounter sugary, faceted, weak snow. You'll break right through. The snow will peel off. You'll end up scratching and thratching around on the slabs, the rock slabs, which in places in the Tetons can be very smooth. And this winter, the snow was really bomber completely unusual, you know, freakish, maybe could be even once in 50 years conditions, I don't know. I know that um, the Hasek McGowan has only been descended once since our descent. Uh, I know last winter a lot of people thought it might be happening, but again we had just a few too many northeast winds and, uh, and the spring was so wet that it didn't quite let it come into condition. So we climbed on up and uh, we, we had started about one in the morning with our big packs, and by two we were ready to ski, not quite from the summit, just a little bit below the summit. The, the summit was still too windblown and rocky, and um, skied down to the south a little bit, cut way across the east face, and got over to the east ridge where we were faced with something that looked to me like an elevator shaft, just headed down into nothing. So here are just a couple photos of Hans skiing in the upper couloir. And this is one of the only ski descents that I've ever been on. You know, um, I had a little, a little camera, fixed focal length, and, and usually it kind of needed two hands. And usually, at any other time, I was willing to actually get two hands up and take a photo. But on this particular descent, you know, I would stop and kind of anchor a ski using techniques that Tom had taught me. And I would take my poles upside down and ram them into the snow as far as I could. And I wouldn't let go with one hand while I tried to take a photo. So a couple of these photos are, these photos are kind of blurry. But that's Hans skiing the upper couloir. And this is actually where it gets easy, down at the very bottom of the last rappel over the ice bulge. And just for scale, there's a bear trend here, which is a big gap where the glacier essentially comes up and meets the snow that goes into the couloir, and that's Hans just getting ready to jump across that bear trend. But I think we got back down to the Teton Glacier around four, and, uh, and, and normally, you know, in ski mountaineering, you really do have this feeling of just utter elation, celebration, you know, like you absolutely just pulled something off. Um, you're the luckiest person in the world generally what I feel, but I, I, in this case, I felt some of that, but I also just felt absolutely exhausted, drained um, mentally and physically, and uh, just remember looking at Hans and just saying, man, I'm so glad we never have to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, puts us up to Brian's talk. to follow, frankly, and I'm pretty honored to be here um, hanging out with these guys because they are uh, they're legends, you know, in this area. 
Um, but uh, I am playing a new game that's uh, kind of new in the ski mountaineering world and um, one a little foreign to those guys because they didn't worry about time splits and stopwatch watching and that sort of thing, which is kind of funny when we talk about it together now. So I'm here to talk about speed. It's, um, like I said, it's kind of a new game, um, and it's a, there's a few of us playing it, some friends of mine from the Wasatch and a few people locally doing it. Um, it's, a, it's new, it's, uh, it's not the best game, it's not the only game, and uh, you know, it's just something that uh, has attracted me and a few others. It's, um, you know, listening to these guys, uh, they, they are the pioneers in the sport. They came around uh, at a time when the sport was ripe to grow in terms of steep skiing. And, you know, they were born in the right years, they moved to the right range, and they were mentored by the right people. And I think that that golden age of Teton uh, exploration has kind of come and gone, and they, they really picked all the good fruit. And now there's uh, other games to play. You know, I was around when they were doing this, um, but I certainly wasn't the skier that they were, and uh, you know, it watched from afar basically. I, w I worked with them in the summer mostly as an Exum guide, um, and read about their exploits in the magazines. I worked with them, but I definitely didn't play with them. Um, so, uh, you know, I started out. I moved to the Tetons full time in 2005, and just like everybody else here in this room was a powder skier. And uh, I mean, we live in the best ski range in the country, I would vote. And uh, we have great snowpack. Um, and, uh, you know, we could ski powder for the rest of our lives and, and be happy. Uh, I made my laps on Wimpy's and 25 short and uh, lots of stuff on the past, just like everybody else. And still never really thought about uh, skiing all this fall you die kind of stuff. I certainly thought about it once in a while when I was on top of the Grand and I'd look straight across south at the north face of Buck Mountain. And there's uh, two of the most compelling lines in the range there, uh, the Bubble Fun Couloir and the Nuke Couloir. Um, and would picture Mark skiing them, I've seen photos of them, uh, pictures of Steven snowboarding them and, and whatnot, um, but never thought that I would sort of get to the point where I'd be doing that sort of thing. During the same time when this was happening, the idea of speed and alpinism was also growing. Um, and you could read about it in the magazines. And it was mostly alpine climbing, but you'd also see it in big wall stuff as well. Um, and uh, this was really my inspiration. There's something about these guys going really fast in a single, uh, single push style uh, where you, know, you start climbing and you don't finish until you are either you know back at the car or at the top or whatever back at camp no camping you're not carrying any bivy gear for the most part um, and they're covering just huge amount of ground uh, and this was pretty unfathomable just a few years before guys that uh, see if i can get this door <clears throat> I wanted to say, um, back up just for a second here, that while I was sort of learning to ski powder and, and getting up into the peaks a little bit, I did ski the Grand Teton once in 2007. And it wasn't in the style that we're going to talk about today, more in the sort of classic style. But this guy, Steve Romeo, sorry, still, <coughs> still a little close for me. <sighs> He and I um, did it in January in uh, pretty awesome conditions, bright sunshine, uh, powder, and uh, we were in no hurry. <laughs> yeah, we, I think it took us eight, nine hours to get to the top. Had a leisurely day in the sun, skiing powder down to the bottom. No worries, as you can tell here, got down to TP call. Um, probably about five, and skied out in the dark, and uh, it was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, I got a taste for the kind of terrain that we would start playing on a few years later. So my inspiration um, in this whole speed game came from guys like this, Rolando Garibaldi, the ubiquitous 
Mark White, Steve House, and Vince Anderson, and of course people in this room like Stephen Koch, Marco Pretzel is not here. These were guys who were setting the standard and that really captured um, my, uh, my imagination. I wasn't going to be a really super hard technical climber. You know, I'm not going to climb 513 or 514 or whatever the standard was. And I, I, I really, I wasn't intrigued by that, but this whole speed thing uh, really caught my attention. While, um, while this was going on and I was skiing more, I uh, got interested in ski mountaineering racing. And some of you, well, probably everybody here is aware of the, the race that we have at the village. Well, this sport was uh, growing in Europe as well. And it, uh, it combined my sort of newfound love and skills in skiing with my lifelong passion as an endurance athlete and, and a competitor. And um, it, it, it really seemed to mix everything perfectly for me. Um, the other part of the, uh, the aspect of ski mountaineering racing is the gear. And we can't really talk about speed and the development of doing things more uh, you know, in less time in the Tetons without talking about the gear and its impact on those pursuits. You see a grand scale here, and this is kind of the cornerstone of everything that we've been doing lately. And, you know, you're weighing everything. Um, the obvious stuff is uh, the skis and the bindings, um, boots as well. This ski, you know, and binding setup weighs a pound 13 ounces. And I have that ski here. If you want to pick it up, it's sort of ridiculous. <laughs> Mountaineering, uh, this is a, a race boot. You know, compare that to your alpine boot. What do they weigh, 10 pounds or something? This thing's uh, less than two pounds. Mountaineering setup, <laughs> this is uh, slightly bigger than a race ski. Uh, but still, it's only uh, less. It's less than three pounds. Again, a race binding. You know, this stuff is available now, and it wasn't for uh, Mark and Tom and everybody else. And I really wonder what they would have done <laughs> with these objectives if they had this stuff. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever know because it's it wasn't there then. Um, but it's certainly driving things uh, now. That's a typical boot that we use for these descents. Again, it's a little bit heavier, you know, two pounds, eight ounces, but way different. Not only do you have to worry about the stuff on your feet, that's the obvious, you have to worry about everything else. <laughs> All right? Um, and you take this grand scale thing out and you start weighing. Well, what's in your pack? You know, does anyone really think about what they put on their back? And what, you know, they have their favorite lifelink pack that they've had for 20 years. They wear it like a badge of honor. But have you ever thought about how heavy the thing is? You know? Well, we did. And so we, uh, we see guys like this, and we, of course, chuckle. And I, I told this guy when I took this photo what, what was going on. And he was very proud of having this you know, steel thermos with him. <laughs> this is not fast and light. <laughs> um, anyway, so the other thing that happens uh, with, with ski mountaineering racing is you got to learn to ski on this stuff, right? It's not pretty by any means. And if it's all about the down for you, this definitely is not the sport for you. Um, but uh, you have to ski on this stuff. And uh, you get to wear funny suits like this. This is over in Europe. Um, and you can tell, I mean, everything is featherweight on these guys, from the clothes to those little G-string harnesses, um, helmets. This is our own race here. Um, <coughs> Just a few shots of, of what the racing is like in Europe. This is the Pyramenta. Um, this is uh, considered the Tour de France of, of ski mountaineering racing. It's four days um, and four stages. They do about 10,000 meters of climbing over the course of the, of the uh, four-day race. And you get to go up stuff like this. You won't find this in this country because of liability issues, um, but you will find plenty of it over there. They're actually on a, on a rope and they're tethered there to some degree. The enthusiasm for the sport is huge as well. Those aren't trees, right? Those are people at the top of the Grand Mont, which is the, the sort of the trophy climb on the third day at the Pyramenta. These guys are up there with cowbells and uh, grills, and they're cooking currywurst, and they're just screaming, they're drinking steins of beer, and it's, it's pretty crazy. And you get to come up, you know, the ridge from back here, right? That's the climb, and then you run through this wall of sound. 
and it's pretty exciting. To do this sort of thing, of course, you've got to be really fit. And again, interjecting ski mountaineering racing into the whole uh, realm of going into the, the big mountains, you get a lot stronger and uh, you train differently, you train scientifically, you worry about your weight like an anorexic cheerleader, even, um, you know, uh, and, and you pay attention to all those little details that a competitive athlete would do. I would argue that most ski tourers are not doing that. And again, it's not for everybody. You gotta like this sort of geeking out of both your training and your gear to, to, to participate at the level that uh, some of my friends are doing it. Um, we, would, uh, we would do more and more on this gear in terms of training, um, and I still wasn't thinking about bringing it into the high peaks, but I was out on Edelweiss in the past, uh, just doing ridiculous amounts of laps, stuff that you wouldn't think about doing on gear that was a lot heavier. I think one day I did eight laps on Edelweiss in about four hours. So I wouldn't be able to do that on traditional touring gear, but on this stuff it feels pretty reasonable. So through the climbing, the guiding, the skiing, the ski mountaineering racing, I developed a skill set of my own and my friends similarly. We weren't great climbers, we certainly weren't great skiers, and if you've seen us ski you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but we developed this, this set of tools um, that allowed us to take the next step that I saw as the evolution in our little sort of niche of the sport. And that aha moment for me, when I finally realized sort of where we were going to take this, was done in the Wasatch of all places by the, some of my partners. And they did something called the WARLOS, which is an acronym for the Wasatch Ultimate Ridge Link-Up on Skis. And basically what it is is a circumnavigation of Little Cottonwood Canyon. You basically start in town. <clears throat> Up to, I forget the name of all the peaks, but you're going all the way up to Alta and then all the way back down to Lone Pine. And it covers, I forget how many peaks over 11,000 feet, but it's about 6,000 meters of climbing and descending and about 50 kilometers. And they did this over the course of 21 hours. They didn't quite complete it, they didn't make a, the full traverse, but they, I mean, 21 hours non-stop and they did it on race gear they were in little lycra suits and funny harnesses and the whole deal um, and it really sort of set the stage for everything else and we realized that you know you could ski this terrain um, on this kind of gear that was in the spring of 2010 and uh, we thought about it all summer and i became friends with these guys through the racing deal and um the next winter, Jared showed up, and we, uh, he was really keen on giving the Grand a try. It seems like the guys in Salt Lake are just obsessed with the Grand, and as I guess most mountaineers are at some point, but they couldn't get enough of it. And uh, Jared showed up in January, and uh, sure enough, there he was in the parking lot at Bradley Taggart in a funny little Lycra suit. I had a helmet on, I had my little G-string harness already on, and uh, these silly little 160 skis, and we were about to haul ass uh, up uh, Garnet Canyon and give the Grand a try in full winter conditions. It was pretty weird. <laughs> um, we didn't make it. We got to Glencoe Call in about three and a half hours, and uh, it was so windy and so cold. I even saw Romeo. Uh, he was turning around from his objective that day, but it was really wind loaded. Um, but it really set the stage because we said, oh wow, look where we got, you know, we can, we can do this, but we need better weather, better weather and better conditions. Uh, eventually we got that and, uh, you know, we, we played around on uh, lesser, I wouldn't say lesser, but not grand uh, objectives. This is at the bottom of the bubble fund couloir where your pucker factor is high while you're looking around for a anchor uh, to repel about 60 meters over the, uh, the cliff band at the bottom of this thing. And this, uh, these sorts of objectives were where we spent um, kind of honing our techniques, seeing what gear we could get away with, and that's really what you're talking about here, and uh, making sure we were up to the skiing on this, on this stuff. Sometime in May, I don't remember the exact date, but we, um, we got that, that beautiful spring window that uh, everybody waits for. And as you know, we had this seriously fat winter and um, <coughs> conditions were perfect on the ground. And we took advantage of it. 
So these are the guys from Salt Lake. Um, during that time, there were three of them. There was me, Nate Brown, uh, and all uh, sort of collectively coined this thing, the, the Grand Teton Sp Speed Project. Um, and uh, we, mainly these guys actually, wanted to just drive that time down as far as they could. And I found myself giving up quite a few other objectives that I thought I would take on uh, in favor of um, doing the Grand. This is a guy, Brian Story, uh, from Missoula. He, uh, during one of our attempts, comes blowing by us, and we had only seen him at a race, and he's in a full race suit. Uh, we had since graduated out of that because we felt too conspicuous, but he was <laughs> full on into it, and uh, he went up and down in five hours and 23 minutes, just missing the standard that was set by uh, Jason DeRay and Andy DeRay here and Jared Inouye. Over the course of about three weeks, we climbed and skied the Grand uh, four times in different combinations of people. I did it three times, and I think everybody did it at least twice. Um, Andy, uh, by the way, is a, is a resident in emergency medicine, so he's a doctor you know, training and working crazy hours, and he'll get off at 10 at night and literally drive up here to climb and ski the Grand the next day just completely on his lips. But he's such a talented athlete that he can pull it off. This is Brian <laughs> in the full glory of his suit. Um, <laughs> this is our, I think this was our last attempt here. Uh, I had finally had warm, sunny conditions in the fort. Usually we're skiing it in winter <laughs> snow, even though it's springtime. It's usually pretty chalky in there. <clears throat> Again, looking down the fort, I'm just using pictures from the grand here. Um, so that, I guess, is a, a small piece of what we're doing. Um, you know, I focused on the Grand because that's kind of where it all happened. And it's pretty fresh, really. Um, we've done some other things. We linked, um, you know, the Grand, the Middle, and the South together, something first done by um, Mark and, is it Stephen or Hans? Even. Um, long before, and then Jimmy Chin did it, and, and there's been some traction doing that. But we're also thinking about other ways to, to link other, uh, other objectives together. And I think you're limited only by your endurance and daylight, and then, you know, of course, conditions have to be perfect. I don't think there's any, uh, <clears throat> I don't think this talk would be complete without recognizing the risk that this style of skiing takes on. Um, you know, we could probably debate this for hours about the fragility or potential fragility of the equipment. You know, what happens when a, when a race binding breaks and you're in one of these jump turns on 50 degree snow? You know, like Mark said, it would be fatal. But I think we trust the gear, and the gear definitely gets tested um, in these races. Um, and then other things uh, like what's in your pack? You know, what happens if somebody blows a knee in the middle of one of the, in the approach, for instance? Uh, something that's not uh, unfathomable, walking around in crampons on boulders. <clears throat> you know, what happens if you have to hang out at night? So there's, you know, you, you decide what, what needs to be in your pack and you take out what you think you can get away with, but uh, we, we fully admit that we could get up, you know, get caught short. And I think any time you go into the mountains with certain objectives that require uh, specialized gear, uh, that danger looms for sure. And you know, you have to realize what the risks are and then just accept them or not. Uh, fill your pack if you have to, but if you want to do some of this stuff, leave some of the stuff at home. That's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> The audience is going to ask, so I, I'll beat them to it. <laughs> to ski the Grand now and be respectable, though, what are, what are your splits? What are you looking at here? <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm the old guy in the group at 50, so I'm not going to be toying with what they're doing. Um, so, but I did talk to Jared and Andy and Jason, and I wasn't on that, uh, that standard setting uh, trip they had. They did it in 517, car to car. And that's on the summer trail. So these guys are collegiate runners. So they're literally jogging up the trail to uh, below the boulders and then switching out of uh, running shoes <clears throat> and into their ski gear there. I think it will actually go faster if you could ski all the way to the car. That said, they go from the, the parking lot at uh, Lupin Meadows to Lunch Rock 
in about an hour 15 or so. They're at, um, they're at Glencoe Call at 2, I think I heard 2, 2.38 or 2 hours, 2.38, and at the summit in 3 hours or less. Um, and then out in, you know, 5.17. So there's, there's so much, you know, the thing about doing it as often as we did is we got just so totally intimate with the conditions. And, you know, the Chevy was fat, we knew it would go, we left the ropes behind, we left the harnesses behind. I mean, that's the kind of thing it takes to make it happen. You don't just go up there willy-nilly and hope it's right. I mean, I tried to do it the other day, um, a week ago, in this style, and there was no snow in, in uh, the Stetner, hardly any ice. And I decided it wasn't conducive to me down soloing, so I turned around. Um, so I didn't know what the conditions were like, and I was not successful. There were some other guys there with big alpine skiing helmets. They had huge fat skis, and I think they actually got up and down. You know, different style, and they were successful. So, like I said, this doesn't work all the time. But you know, when we did it so many times in a row, we really did have an understanding of what we were getting into. The weather was perfect, and you know, like Mark said, we got away with something for sure. And um, remind me again, you skied from Glencoe Call back to the car. Uh, 38 minutes. 38 minutes. Yeah, because you know we hadn't had an opportunity to to see. Okay, we can we know how long it takes us to get up and down to a certain place, but what would it be like to be able to ski all the way out to the car? How does that change the you know the record or whatever? And um, so I I skied pretty cleanly, maybe could have, could have gone a little bit faster, but pretty steadily out, and it was 38 minutes. And I haven't. I, I asked those guys that in an email. They didn't respond. But I wonder how you know if you throw that on to the end of their attempt, where that would put the put the time split. And one final easy question: Did you really choose to do this, or were you destined to do this? Is this, <laughs> is this the pinnacle of what you were meant to do? Uh, boy, that's a good question. It feels that way. It, you know, there was a moment last year where it's like, oh, this is the game I meant to play. You know, because like done all the, all the little games that we play as climbers, from ice climbing and alpine climbing and rock climbing and sport climbing and skiing and all that. But this seemed to be the, the best collection of all those skills and it felt like you get to use all the toys and uh, you know, I have the right parents, have a pretty good aerobic engine and I got to even use that and I, yeah, I liked all that so it seemed to be where I should play I guess as a mountaineer. Wish I wasn't 50. <laughs> Let's, uh, we'll, we'll open it up to questions, and um, then Leslie Matson will come up with uh, some final words. So I got a question. Brian, uh, so now you're moving to Anchorage, is Denali going to be your Oh next boy. For yeah, it, it scares me to even think about attempting that. I, I like to say I'm too old to do that. Um, but yeah, you know, there, there are guys, the French guys particularly, we laugh at the French and their funny outfits, but they're the ones that uh, push that kind of thing. And I think that that has been attempted, but nothing very um, significant has been done. I think there's a lot of room, if this is what you like to do, to set the standard on Denali. But boy, the stakes are high because as you know, you get up 18,000 feet and you don't have much in your pack and one of those big storms just slams the mountain, you're gonna, you're gonna die. <clears throat> Fortunately, the weather forecasting is pretty good these days. So if you just happen to be there in the right set of conditions, you were fit, you were acclimatized, it could happen. But living in Anchorage, I, I don't see it because, you know, I'm, I have a real job. I'm not going to be able to be acclimatized. So the, the opportunity or the chances of all those factors coming together for a guy who only has two-week vacation, nah, can't imagine. There's lesser things to do there, but that one I'll, I think I'll wait and watch. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Anybody else? Do you ever have a desire to just do multiple laps on one of these fat megawatts? <laughs> <laughs> what is that back there? <laughs> I don't own any, unfortunately. I have gone a little bit fatter. I have a 9,500 foot ski. It's pretty darn fun. I, I sort of get it. <laughs> so.
sort of. It's funny, I, I actually won a pair of fat skis, um, the justices, in a, in a race, and it was kind of ironic, because it's a random ski race, and I hear I got these giant skis, and I sold them 24 hours after I got them for $400. It was like kind of cocaine, you know, I didn't even want to try it once. <laughs> Anyone else? Cool. Well, thanks. Oh, and uh, by the way, feel free to come up here and fondle this gear. Uh, some of it's pretty silly heavy, and some of it's pretty silly light, and then it'll give you an idea of what Mark and Hans and everybody were up against when they were doing what they were doing. It makes it even burlier, for sure. Okay. So, oh, one more question. When you're on the Hasek, Mark, uh, coming up off that upper couloir, doing that traverse over, did you guys traverse that, or did you wrap uh, you know, off the, that steep snow field? Uh, yeah, we, we traversed on skis. So, you know, once we got to that point on the way up, <clears throat> we knew we could jettison a little bit of gear. A little bit of gear left the rope. And I remember distinctly getting back down to the rope and uh, putting it in my pack and making one more turn. And just that added couple pounds kind of freaked me out and uh, <laughs> felt really weird. But that was probably the steepest terrain I've ever been on. Turned this sharp corner and it felt like my elbow was dragging on the snow and um, worked our way as far as we could down and over to our first rappel because we didn't want to do any extra rappels and um, couldn't quite get to the rock. The rock was sort of slabby. We couldn't see many cracks, so we ended up um, digging something called a snow bollard. And I don't know how many of you have done any snow mountaineering or have an experience with that, but snow bollards are not really reliable. They're not, they're, you basically um, etch a groove in the snow, you know, maybe uh, a, a little less than a meter in diameter, and, um, and, and hope that the snow is firm enough. Typically in the Tetons, it's not, unless you're out in the spring. So we, I think that day we backed it up with a couple power bars that we were hopeful we wouldn't need, but you need some, something back there to keep the rope from cutting through the snow. And we did our, our first rappel off that snowballer, and fortunately um, went over this little drop, uh, snow and, and rock, and as we were dropping past that rock, saw a, a pin that we could use for our next wrap, and did another wrap to get into the lower couloir. So, uh, and, and these days, what people typically do, rather than carve a snowballer like that, uh, and, and I don't necessarily know why we didn't think of this, because I think we knew about it, but, um, you know, Doug Coombs was skiing around with a little piece of two by four, and he would bury the two by four as a dead man, and, um, you know, put a piece of webbing off of that and use that. That's a much stronger anchor, because once you work hard in the snow around that dead man, it's actually pretty solid. And, and if um, that particular anchor that we use would not have been on our ascent track, but if you do ski, exactly ski your descent track, if you, if you, your ascent track, if you ski your ascent track and you know you'll have a rappel, you can actually set that anchor on the way up. And for myself, rather than bring a two by four, I would usually just snap off a branch as I was going through the trees down low and stick that in my pack and use that. But, um, Does Brian need a carbon fiber hockey stick? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's safe to say for the three of us that we, we all agreed, you know, in putting this talk together that we never were really able to find our way in the normal world. We just like can't concentrate and. You know, to, to be successful these days, you really just have to be able to sit down and concentrate, whether it's on numbers or reading, and, and, um, and, and we're still trying to <laughs> really do that. I guess Brian made it through PA school. Good on you. But um, how many times did I drop out? <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all wringing our hands that the future of mankind has no place for people who, who uh, are, are best at just being physically active for long periods of time because they're... There are no forests to cut down without big machines and fields to hoe and things to carry around. It's all done by mechanical stuff where you sit and push buttons, so we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well go climbing. I have a question. Besides uh, speed, 
Well, I mean, skiing, where, where would you like to see the future of uh, ski mountaineering in the Tetons, and or where do you see it going? <clears throat> well, I, I know where I would go if I were still in the game. But, and I, I'm pretty free about talking about it, but I really think that, um, you know, listening to the splits, the, that the Hasek McGowan ought to be up, able to be linked with the Northeast Snowfields, which ought to be able to li be linked with the east face of Tiwanak. <laughs> yeah, one push. I think we need to give these guys an amazing hand. Thank you very, very much. Ryan, Tom, and Mark. I can assure you that Mark Newcomb never fell down toilet bowl. <laughs> off a mogul. It was the expert juice. Oh, excuse me. Um, quickly, we do have some stuff to raffle off, but I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of the Grand Teton National Park Foundation, thank our three um, gentlemen who came out to the park and spent some time obviously preparing for this, putting thoughts down on paper, really moving everything you said, exciting, very powerful. And then are we going to open the window so we can see the mountains? Um, it was our vision as part of the fundraising partner for Grand Teton National Park that this space would host these sorts of events. So um, thank you for premiering this for us so we can listen about the amazing things you're doing in this place. And that's why I really wanted to have the windows <laughs> open. Thank you. Um, just as background, the Grand Teton National Park Foundation is the private fundraising partner of Grand Teton National Park. We participated with our partner in uh, putting together this building, the original facility with the mountaineering exhibit, which I would also point out that Mark and Tom both were involved with that committee to make sure that that exhibit was the best it could possibly be participated on that. in that. Um, so we raised $13 million for the building, the total $20 million project. And this uh, auditorium was a $4 million effort that we raised 100% privately so that we could do programs like this for our community and for the visitors who come here and fall in love with Grand But Really, thanks for coming out to Moose uh, during the week. And again, thanks to you guys very much. <laughs>